Most people have a set of morals that they would never break. We all have acts that we perceive to be just outright horrendous, so we would never do them. And this is a very good thing. Lots of people having a strong set of morals is what holds society together. Without these morals, we couldn't call ourselves civilised. And we would never break these morals under any circumstances. Well, survival instinct is a hell of a thing. The 1972 Andes plane crash. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is sponsored by Fume. Fume is an award nominated device that is all about helping you break your bad habits in an innovative way. But breaking a bad habit doesn't have to be an uncomfortable or drastic change, so Fume is here to remove the bad from the habit. Instead of using electronics and annoying people with giant flavoured clouds, Fume is completely natural and instead uses flavoured air. Not only is the air flavoured, it is made using all natural delicious flavours that contain no harmful chemicals. So Fume really is all good with no bad sides. You can simply enjoy your habit guilt free and replace your old bad habits easily. Your fume will come with an adjustable airflow dial that is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers something to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. After trying fume myself, I was honestly very surprised at how flavourful it is. It feels very fresh and the moving parts are great for helping to fight stress. I've been feeling great since using it. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories. And there's no reason that can't be you. Fume has also released some new flavour cores. These cores include orange vanilla, raspberry lemon and sparkling grapefruit. I've had a chance to try all three of these flavours and they are all very, very tasty. The orange vanilla flavour is sweet and citrusy with a touch of classic vanilla, the raspberry lemon flavour is full bodied lemonade with a hint of berries and the sparkling grapefruit flavour is fresh and cooling like fruity grapefruit. So join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash dankula or scan the QR code on the screen and use code dankula to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfumefum.com and use code dankula to save an additional 10% off your order. In the modern day with our pocket sized devices that have built in GPS and can reach almost anywhere in the world and also with technology such as Starlink, this event would have been over within a few hours, if not within a day or two. But unfortunately for the passengers of a Fairchild FH-227D, it was October the 12th 1972 and there was no way of contacting anyone. Members of an amateur rugby team called the Old Christians Club left from Montevideo, Uruguay where they were due to play in Santiago, Chile against the Old Boys Club, which was an English rugby team. To get to the game, they would need to take a plane. The team decided, however, that travelling together on a commercial flight would be a bit of a nightmare. So, they decided to hire a private plane for the team and chartered the journey to Santiago. A decision that they would quickly come to heavily regret. Some family members, crew and friends of players also decided to come along on the flight because they wanted to watch the game. So, on October the 13th of 1972, the plane set off filled with many people all happy and excited to go to the match. The journey had been done successfully many times before. The pilot, Julio Ferradis, had plenty of experience and had flown across the Andes 29 times before. 
But on this occasion, his co-pilot, Dante Lagrara, was a trainee, and he was the one manning the controls. Also, the clouds were extremely thick, meaning the mountaintops couldn't be seen. The plane was four years old and had reached 792 airframe hours, which is the amount of time that a plane is in the air as soon as the wheels leave the ground. The plane had actually been nicknamed the Lead Sled by other pilots because they believed it to be too heavy and underpowered for the journey. Turns out the power of the plane wasn't an issue at all. As I mentioned before, the clouds had gotten so thick that the pilots couldn't see the mountain peaks or even know where they were and establish their location. The pilot was using dead reckoning to establish their position on the map. Dead reckoning is calculating the position of a moving object by using a previously known position and direction and then calculating the distance by using speed. He was also using radio navigation. The pilot attempted a landing much earlier than he should have. Normally it would take 11 minutes, but instead the pilot attempted to do it in only 3 minutes. He also turned north towards Santiago much too early, which put the plane directly in the line of the mountains. Turbulence had made the plane drop hundreds of feet and it kept hitting air pockets that made it drop even lower. Apparently the passengers joked about the first drop from turbulence, thinking it was a normal occurrence. However, they started to get a little bit worried when the plane had gotten so low that they could see mountains just 10 to 20 feet out of their window. Then, only moments later, the flight became a horror story. The plane hit the mountain multiple times, ripping off the right wing, the tail, and then finally, the left wing. They then fell 18,000 feet, or 5,500 meters, into a high glacial valley in the Andes Mountains. During the fall, seven of the passengers were sucked out of the plane and killed instantly, with five dying during the initial impact of the landing. The baggage hold had also been ripped open, which pulled all of the passengers' luggage out of the plane. So, many of the passengers' personal items were completely lost and scattered, and recovering them would have likely been pointless and probably impossible without climbing gear. The plane crash-landed and then slid down the glacier like a sled at 220 miles per hour, and then came to a stop when it hit a snowbank. The force of the impact was so strong that it ripped some of the seats off of the plane, and it also crushed the cockpit with the pilots inside, killing them instantly. 32 people had survived the crash in various states of injury and consciousness. Some were believed to be dead when in fact they were in a coma, and the cold of the mountain actually helped them recover since it slowed their heart rate. Some of the survivors had wounds from pieces of the plane sticking into them, and others had broken bones. Luckily, two of the survivors had some medical training, and 19-year-old Roberto Canessa was a medical student who quickly tried to help the survivors. Unfortunately for Carlos Valletta, he had survived the fall from the back of the plane, but he had fallen into very deep snow where he couldn't breathe. And sadly, the survivors didn't find him until later. Once everyone had collected their nerves and had calmed down from the crash, there were very many problems that quickly became very obvious. Such as the fact that it was minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius. And that there was barely any food since all of their luggage had been sucked out of the plane. After searching the wreckage, they found a bottle of rum and a small amount of snacks, though that would only last them for a few days. After the plane didn't arrive in Santiago on time, the Chilean Air Force sent out a search and rescue mission, meaning they followed the flight path that the plane was supposed to take to look for the plane. But since the plane went off course, the Air Force couldn't find anything. So, after hours and hours of searching, they eventually called off the search. The first night for the survivors claimed four more people due to the cold. And since most of them had never seen a dead body before, some of the survivors were screaming in fear and shock. 
The next day, many of them were telling each other that everything would be okay and that they would soon be rescued. This temporarily lifted some spirits. I'm sure there was already a lot of relief knowing that you had survived a plane crash and surely things couldn't get any worse. At one point, an aircraft flew over the crash site, which excited all of the survivors. They jumped and waved their arms, shouting loudly, thinking they had definitely been spotted. Unfortunately, they could actually barely be seen on the blinding white snow. Even the plain fuselage wasn't visible since the white paint actually camouflaged it against the snow. And also the glare from the sun made it even harder for the pilots to spot the survivors. Unfortunately, on that day, one of the survivors, Nando Parado, woke up from his coma to discover that his mother was dead and his younger sister was severely injured, which ended up only getting worse and she too died from her wounds a few days later. The survivors ended up getting snow blindness since all they could see was bright white snow. So they created improvised sunglasses using the sun visor in the pilot's cabin, a piece of wire and a brass strap. Most of the survivors lived near coastlines and were used to warm and sunny weather, which meant that for some of them, this was the first time they had seen snow and it was definitely the first time that they had experienced this kind of cold. The air was also a lot thinner, so they were breathing a lot quicker, and this would have contributed to them feeling much weaker, hungrier, and colder than they were used to. The cold in the wind also made them very thirsty and cracked their lips to the point of bleeding, which stung as they drank water, making it a vicious cycle. The survivors later found a working handheld transistor radio in the wreckage of the plane, and they were hoping to hear stories of rescue teams working their hardest to find and save them. Unfortunately, the only thing they heard were reports that none of them could have possibly survived and they were all believed to be dead, which meant that the search was called off completely. They now knew that they were completely on their own. And just when they thought things couldn't get any worse, an avalanche happened at around midnight while the survivors were sleeping, as the fuselage was battered by the snow and everyone inside was thrown around like ragdolls, that ended up killing eight more people. They then realised that they were buried and there was no fresh oxygen coming into the plane. As they panicked, they managed to use a metal pole to break through one of the windows and clear the snow so they could breathe again. If they had been buried any deeper, they would all have died from asphyxiation. They managed to dig a tunnel to the surface, but they stayed inside the fuselage for the whole day because there was a blizzard raging outside. Inside the fuselage, they were in a cramped space surrounded by dead bodies, rationing food and sitting closely together for warmth. One of the survivors, Nando, said that he was cradling a single chocolate-covered peanut, but he couldn't bring himself to eat it straight away. The next day, he let the chocolate melt in his mouth, and then he kept the peanut in his mouth the following day, taking tiny little bites of it throughout the day. And then once it was done, that was it. After this point, they were starving, and they had absolutely nothing to eat. The survivor, Robert Canessa, later said that after only a few days, they started to feel the sensation of their bodies consuming themselves to stay alive. But they were surrounded by a lot of frozen meat. The human meat from the dead bodies of their family and friends. Many of the crew said that getting emotional was the last thing on their mind while they were trying to survive. On top of that, they were dealing with extremely cold weather and hunger to the point where they would eat pretty much anything. And situations like this don't call for morals. They call for survival. So the survivors had to knuckle up and do whatever it takes to survive. The issue was they still had to ration because they didn't know how long they would have to survive. The meat was also raw and cold because they couldn't light a fire. The survivors recollected that it tasted something similar to beef or pork. 
They held out as long as they possibly could, but eventually they gave in, using broken glass to cut off the softer parts of the bodies, such as the arse meat, which would be a lot funnier outside of the given context. Uh, one of the survivors actually said that when he first ate the meat, he gagged because it was soft, wet and greasy. In some of the photos of the survivors, you can actually see the remains of human body parts that they've been eating. In one picture specifically, probably the most infamous picture of this entire event, a spinal column can actually be seen laying on the ground next to them, and you can tell that it's kind of been picked clean. I'm of course not going to show the uncensored picture because... YouTube. Exposure to the extreme cold was another problem that they had to deal with because inevitably they would have gotten severe frostbite and hypothermia because they were flying to a warm country. They hadn't exactly packed for this kind of weather, let alone sub-zero temperatures that they were dealing with. To deal with the cold, they dismantled seats from the plane and piled them up to create a sort of shelter and they used aluminium backing from the seats to warm snow in the sun to make drinking water, which they used to fill empty wine bottles and tin cans. The elevation that they were at meant that they got just as thirsty as they would in a desert, despite being surrounded by snow. They also used other debris from the plane to barricade the open end of the fuselage in an attempt to keep warm. Luckily, their collective body temperatures were enough to keep them from freezing to death. As things got worse, Nando started to talk about walking his way out of the glacier, even if it may be suicide, with no equipment at all, not even climbing gear. Nando and Roberto decided to cross the Andes with no mountaineering experience whatsoever after the survivors had already spent two months on the mountain with no signs at all that help was coming. They had no real food, so they carried rations of human meat wrapped in rugby socks. Over the weeks before, some of the survivors had checked out the surrounding area for a way to escape, but every time they decided it would be impossible because of their condition, the elements outside, and the depth of the snow, which would have made the journey fatal. And that kept making them return to the plane. But this time, Nando and Roberto didn't really care about anything else other than getting out. They knew they were going to die anyway, so they might as well die trying to escape. Most of the other survivors, though, were too weak or wounded to go on the journey, so they would have just definitely died. One of them even had sepsis by this point. As summer was approaching, the men decided to wait for seven days for the weather to warm up before setting off obviously increasing their likelihood of survival. They decided to go east to Chile, as the opposite direction was far too mountainous. And after days of walking, they very luckily stumbled into the tail section of the plane, where they found some actual food. They found three meat patties, a box of chocolates, a bottle of rum, and the most important thing, cigarettes. They also found a small amount of medicine. That night, the men rested and camped under the tail section of the plane, eating and sitting around a warm fire, which I'm sure definitely motivated them. They did consider taking the batteries from the tail section of the plane so that they could power the radio back at the fuselage, but they realised that the batteries weighed 53 pounds and they were just too heavy to carry back. The men realised that they were not going to be able to get the radio working, and on top of that, they almost froze to death during the night. So, they walked all the way back, returning to the camp. Some of the items they found in the tail section meant that they could make improvised sleeping bags, which none of them had until now. This would make it much easier for the men to spend days walking without having to worry about freezing to death in their sleep. So, the men decided to go in the opposite direction this time, and headed west. Sadly, during this time, three more survivors lost their lives. Two died from gangrene due to infected injuries, and the other died of starvation, since they actually refused to eat any of the human meat. 
at the moment of their death, they weighed only 55 pounds or 25 kilograms. The journey for rescue absolutely needed to happen now, because if it didn't, they would all die. After around 10 days of walking and trying to find help, the men noticed that from every direction all they could see was mountains as far as the horizon. But they refused to be disheartened. Nando said that they may be walking to their deaths, but he would rather go out and meet his death instead of waiting for it to find him. Nando and Roberto followed a ridge into a valley which then led to a river that feeds the Rio San Jose and they noticed that the snow was clearing. More and more green plants were surrounding them, giving them an indication that they were heading in the right direction. They then saw evidence of previous camps and herds of cows. In the evening, they arrived at a very dangerous, impassable river, and while they were building a campfire, they saw three men on horseback across the river, but the water was so loud that they struggled to communicate. One of the men on horseback then shouted, Tomorrow, and rode off. But the next day, he returned, and I can only imagine how pissed off and relieved the men were when he said he would be back the following day. The man was a Chilean farmer named Sergio Catalan. He tied a piece of paper to a rock and threw it over to Nando and Roberto so they could communicate. At this point, Nando had dysentery and Roberto was severely exhausted. They wrote about the crash and the other survivors. The farmer then threw over some bread for the men. The two survivors said that the bread tasted like the best thing that they had ever eaten in their entire lives. Good guy Sergio Catalan then rode his horse for 10 hours to bring help to the survivors of the crash. Despite the starvation, weakness and tiredness, some even on the verge of dying, knowing that they were finally going to be saved gave them relief and energy. One of the survivors said that the three helicopters coming to save them were like birds of freedom. Unfortunately, because of the landing conditions, only half of the survivors could be rescued, so they took the most vulnerable and injured ones first. Four members of the search and rescue team decided to stay behind with the rest of the survivors and give them medical attention, and they slept with them in the fuselage for the last night that they were going to spend in that hell. The next day, the rest of the survivors were rescued. There were a total of 16 survivors rescued and unfortunately, 29 deaths. Some of the parents that were waiting to see the survivors were both ecstatic and in anguish at the same time since they found out that their son had lived but their wife and daughters had not. They had been lost in the peaks of the Andes, surviving freezing temperatures and near starvation for 72 days. I'm sure many of the survivors never took food, water and shelter for granted ever again. After the rescue and once things had started to calm down a little bit, people started to speculate about how the men had survived for so long with so little food. Rumours began to spread about how they killed each other for meat and eventually became feral, which made the story spread even further with the horrific news spin. Two Chilean papers even printed a half-eaten leg on their publication cover reporting that all of the passengers had partaken in cannibalism and they were attacking them for it. There is still, to this day, a bunch of wild theories about what happened but most of it is just exaggerated or sensationalised. The crash site was unnamed during the crash but today it has now been named the Valley of Tears, which... Sounds like something from a Soulsborne game. The site now attracts hundreds of people who take the three-day journey to go and pay their respects to the dead and missing. The survivors went back to a completely new life. Not just because of how the experience had changed them as people, but because now everyone wanted to hear their story. Some of them travelled the world and made a living just from doing interviews. It's stories like these that prove just how strong humans can be when they need to survive. 
These were average everyday people who did not have the supplies, training or experience, yet they still did what they needed to do to continue living. Most of them have put these events very far in their past and they have moved on to have happy and successful lives. A veces se romantiza esta historia, pero fue una tragedia espeluznante. Nosotros estuvimos en un infierno, ¿no? O sea, comparado con lo que nosotros vivimos, el infierno era cómodo. Cuando el destino te atropella, no te avisa. No te avisa el destino. El mejor día de tu vida y el peor día de tu vida amanecen iguales. A 50 años después, eh, la vida sigue. Entonces yo le digo a la gente, disfruten el presente. El pasado ya pasó. As for anyone who says that they would never ever resort to cannibalism, I would say you just haven't been in the right circumstances. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.